Welcome to the first edition of the Research Tools Workshop in the College of Education and Health Sciences. The idea for this series of workshops came about because of some suggestions from a informal writing group that has formed in the CEHS. And one of the things that came across my electronic desk around the same time that this suggestion was coming was this particular article here that appeared in Inside Higher Education, which I thought was interesting because it essentially looks at this idea of faculty and their ability to and their desire to essentially promote themselves, in particular promote their research. And this particular article here was speaking to the fact that essentially women tend not to promote themselves as much as what men do and even the way in which women tend to promote themselves tends to be much less positive than the way in which men promote themselves and this really hit home for me because I know as an individual I tend to have a fairly robust online presence in terms of my teaching research and scholarship in particular uh, the research and scholarship aspect of it and when I look across my colleagues throughout the CEHS I don't see the same level of engagement in many of these online services and I don't think that it is a coincidence that so many of my colleagues are female um, essentially, as a college, we are living out the findings that this particular study found, that we have our female scholars that are doing some wonderful work uh, when it comes to research. However, a lot of that is going under the radar, both within their fields, but in particular among their colleagues and within the broader community because of a inability or a lack of desire to promote that themselves. So what this series is designed to do is to provide you with a, a number of tools that you could use to promote your research and scholarship and even your teaching. So what we're going to do today in the first of these workshops is I'm going to give a primer on a number of open scholarship and social media tools that you could use to promote yourself as a scholar here at Toro University. And one of the things that we will continue with these monthly workshops is this is going to be a primer where I'm basically just going to show a bunch of different tools and what they can do and how you might want to use them and spending two or three minutes on each tool. And then in subsequent workshops, what we will be doing is usually taking a look at one or two tools per workshop and actually going through and looking at how to use them and why you might want to use them. So this one here is designed to essentially let you see what's available and then based upon what you might be interested in using, then you can determine whether or not you want to show up to the subsequent workshops. So if a tool like ResearchGate is one that's of interest to you or if blogging is a tool that is, is of interest to you, then you would show up to the session where we focus upon that. Um, so that way you could ignore the ones that aren't tools that you specifically want to use. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the different options that you have available to publicize your work as a scholar, regardless if it's the teaching, research, or service. The first, and I guess most basic one, is your individual faculty profile on the Toro University California website. If you haven't looked at it or haven't looked at it in a while, if you scroll up under the faculty staff tab up here and select faculty staff directory, and if you scroll down to where you're located, it will bring up your profile. And as you can see, I just have the very basic information in here. I'm not making use of this really all that much at all. Um, if you want to update your material, if you were to click down here on the last updated option, it'll ask you to log into OU Campus, and your login for that is the same as your Tor one credentials and when you get in here you are able to do a multi-edit 
and you're able to upload a different picture other than the one that's there. Uh, as you can see, you can add in some of the information that's here and you have the ability to add a bio, your education, your teaching, your research, your grants, your publications, any affiliations, honors, additional employment. So there's a lot of information that you can add in here that the vast majority of faculty haven't taken the opportunity to do so. So this is actually probably one of the most basic ways that you can publicize your work because it's the institutional way. Um, so this would be essentially where people would go to find you as a faculty member is to go and check out your university website. Uh, so the more information you have here, it's a, as you can see a very easy process in order to actually provide information about yourself. Another common way that folks use is through the use of a personal homepage. So you can see mine here, and it was last updated, I guess, earlier this month. And you can see it's a very basic web page, has some minor information about myself here, uh, has a list of the various social networks that I'm on, and links to the profiles there. Uh, by the looks of it, you can see I've got a home, my CV is there, biography, teaching, research, and service, and by the looks of it, at some point I was planning to put a faculty development link there that I haven't finished yet. Um, but the most important thing is you'll note that the URL is michaelbarber.com, and that's something that um, I pay for every year as a service. I've registered my domain, and uh, registering a domain tends to be fairly cheap these days. If you get a deal, you can actually get it for a minimal amount of money for the first couple of years. Uh, in most cases, registration and hosting services are going to run you probably in the range of 25 to 50 bucks a year uh, to be able to do this. If you don't want to pay for your own domain, uh, you could always go with something like Google Sites. So this is a former doc student of mine, and um, you can see here he's used Google Sites, and so his name Jason Paul Psycho, still appears in the web address, still appears in the URL, so you can see that um, you still have that aspect of branding, and he's got many of the same things that I had, a biography, he's got a consulting and speaking link, um, he's got a design link, which basically shows off his skills in those areas, he's got his research link and a teaching link that he's got here as well. You can see right on the home page he's got a link to his CV. Um, and a little about me biography type thing here. Uh, so again, it's a nice, quick, professional homepage, and you can use Google for this. There's a number of other sites that you could use that provide a free or low-cost option to allow you to do that. If you don't want to do a personal website, so if you don't want you know your name in the URL, in the web address, one of the things that you can do is you can set it up around a project or around a research area. So this is a project that I've been uh, maintaining now for I think 12 or 13 years. Uh, it's the uh, a national study that I do every year back home in Canada. Um, and as you can see what we've done is we've essentially created a, a fairly robust website here around this particular project. So it's State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada. So for the URL, we picked K-12 S-O-T-N, or State of the Nation. And because it's a Canadian project, we wanted to make sure we had the .ca link that's there. So you can see how instead of having a personal website, what we've got is we've got a project-based website that allows us to focus upon a specific thing that we're working on. In your case, it might not be an individual project, it might be a research area. So I could have created a website just on K-12 online learning or K-12 e-learning and tried to come up with some URL that I would have had around K-12 online learning.ca or K-12 online learning.com. I'm not sure which ones of those are available. Um, and that's one of the things about trying to get that customized URL, the earlier you do it or the sooner you do it, the more likely you are to get what it is you're looking for. Um, 
Moving beyond the personal websites, because many of these do require a, a bit of knowledge of uh, web design to be able to create them. Most of them have these tools now where they tend to be formatted quite nicely so that uh, a lot of it is templated. So you just decide on the template that you want and then punch in the information. Um, but there are services that are available as well. So Google Scholar is one of them. Now most of us use Google Scholar to find things. But if you have a Google account, you can see I'm logged in over here. One of the options that you have is to create a profile. And so this is my Google Scholar profile. And it allows you to, if you see when I go into the editing, I can put in certain information about myself and they actually want an institutional email for verification. I can make my profile public or private and personally I would say if you're going to take the time to create one of these profiles make sure that you do make it public. And what it does is it trolls the internet looking for instances of my work. Now I can manually add things here just by clicking on the plus button here but for the most part these things here are all things that um, Google Scholar has found on my behalf. Regularly it will ask me if any of these people are co-authors of me, mine and when I say yes they show up here. As you can see it gives you some robust uh, information in terms of the type of data that you can get uh, from an academic standpoint. So I can look at any of my articles and I can just click on this number here and see the 96 times that this particular uh, book has been cited and uh, so it, it does provide a lot of useful information for you as you're looking through and it's something that's really quick and easy. The other thing that I particularly like about it is if you are searching a topic so let me just search virtual schooling you can see that some people have an underline in the authors and others don't the ones that have underlines are those that have their profiles set up. So in this case, Rick Ferdig has a profile set up. Kathy Cavanaugh has a profile set up. Meredith DiPietro doesn't. So if this is an article that I was really interested in as a uh, individual who's searching on Google Scholar, I can say, oh, well, Rick has authored this. Let me go see what else Ferdig here has authored. And I can click on it and it takes me to his public profile. So then I can go through and find other things on the topic that he's written. So if somebody finds one of your articles because they're searching for a topic, this gives them the ability to directly go to your site, to your, your profile, to see other things that you may have authored on the topic. So it increases your visibility for that particular research area. So Google Scholar and the Google Scholar profile that you can create can be not just a useful tool in terms of the collection of your own data and being able to find out information. Uh, it can also be useful for other people to find you. Speaking of institutional resources earlier, one of the institutional resources that we have available to us here at Toro University is Toro Scholar, which is our open access repository for the system. So as you can see here, it's just torosscholar.toro.edu. Um, you can go. So unlike most of the Toro systems, you have to create your own account here and you can see if you don't have an account you can sign up for one um, but basically they want you to use your Toro email address and then you'll choose a password once you log into the system you'll see that there isn't a mechanism for which to actually suggest or post your articles you actually have to send those to the reference librarian in New York but what you can or what you do gain access to in here is once they start posting your publications you get access to a series of analytics that you can use so as you can see here these are my analytics for my readership um, the types of institutions even specific institutions as you can see here uh, various countries you can see how they're finding you so most people seem to be finding me through Google or Google Scholar um, and 
you know, Google Scholar Canada, Google Scholar Philippines. Um, I'm not sure what country code ID is, but I'm going to guess Indonesia. So you can see Google or Google Scholar tends to be where most people find me, and I can actually get uh, additional information here. So it's it's useful in terms of getting some of the statistics that you could use so that you understand how people are finding you and where they're finding you from and in some cases some of these sites will provide you with specific keywords that you're hitting so you can see um, in this case it's showing me the exact specific items that they are coming to find me for or they're looking for when they reach me so there's a lot of information that you can have here in this author dashboard that is available in Toro Scholar. One of the other nice things about Toro Scholar is it is our institutional one. So all you have to do is send the citation for your particular piece of scholarship. And if it already has an open access version, the librarians there will find it and add it to it. If it doesn't, they will actually reach out to the publisher on your behalf and provide and see if they can get access to a version of the article that they can publish. And this is something I know that the institution is really pushing. So you may recall um, that a few days ago we've got a message from uh, Dr. Kadish and you can see one of the things that they were looking for was to try to uh, in this case they're going to create a faculty publications book and one of the things that they'll do once they get a list of all of these publications as you can see here is that all of the items that they collect will be pub posted in, in Toro Scholar. So if you deleted that message by mistake let me know and I can forward it to you Otherwise, I would encourage you to, apparently the citations can be sent to Timothy Valent, uh, who's the scholarly communications librarian in New York, and he's the one that will both be collecting it for this book, and I suspect also the one that is responsible for Toro Scholar. So this is something that the institution is, is really pushing, and if you do anything with any of these tools, this would be one of the open access repositories I would strongly encourage you to do. Another one of the tools that we have available to us that would allow us to showcase our scholarship is a tool like academia.edu. Um, I often describe academia.edu as Facebook for academics. Essentially, it allows you to uh, you know, follow other people. Uh, it allows people to follow your work. You can see you can do the co-authors there. It allows you to add a bio and various um, things that you are interested in in terms of topics. You can add your institutional stuff there. It'll actually track some metrics for you here. Uh, you can add your CV and other social media profiles that you would like to put in there. But most importantly, it allows you to upload individual studies, as you can see. So it allows you to put the full text of some of these things online. So as you can see here, I've gone through and um, added in the uh, abstract. Here's the file here. Because this is an online journal, you can see it gives you the option here of going to where it was located. Um, that's the little blue icon here on the original. Um, so you really have a lot of stuff that you can put in here. It will track when people are viewing your thing, uh, your profile. It will give you alerts as to um, where you're showing up in other people's analytics. You'll notice I just have mine organized by publications and then in some cases my co-authors have uploaded the same file and tagged me in it so I've got those just added to the bottom. What I've seen some people do here is when they start to categorize things like they might say book chapters and journal articles, they might actually put their syllabi up here uh, or other teaching materials. Basically anything that's a file or a link can be added here and you could put in those categories across the top. So it's not just for research specifically. Uh, you could put conference presentations here and upload your PowerPoint files here. So this could be a repository for 
all of those things. Now, they do give you an option to create a personal website for you. Now, that's a pay option. Um, so you can see it asks me if this is the profile I want to use, what field am I in. So I'm just going to say, um, actually, I like the humanities picture a little bit better. So let's go with humanities. That bio is fine. And now it's going to generate my website. So this is the website I would have if they had it. So you can see research, CV, contact. Um, but it's a cost feature. So it's, this is just a preview. It's not live. So this would essentially cost me a certain amount of money. And if I'm already paying for something like this, or not paying, but having something like this created, the need for having this kind of website, I would say, decreases significantly. Um, keep in mind that academia is a, is a social network that is like any other social network, and by that I mean that its users aren't its customers, its users are its data. And this stuff here, you can see the big progressive ad right here, are basically, those are the customers. And essentially, this is where it makes most of its money. Um, you'll note that I could upgrade to premium, which gives me the home page. It also removes these ads. Another site that we have that tends to be less commercial in nature is ResearchGate. So this is my ResearchGate profile here, and you can see it has many of the same features that academia.edu had. So I have the ability to upload my research, and as a part of that, you can see it doesn't provide a lot of the same information in the title of it, but it does pull out some more of the information that you would expect from an open access journal system. So I can just pull out the references. You see it pulls out the abstract and figures here. Um, like all of these systems, it gives you certain analytics and certain stats about not just your overall profile, but your um, the individual articles. Both of them provide some level of citations. So you can see this one hasn't been cited yet, but apparently it has been read 24 times, three of which are new according to this. Um, so there are a lot of things that you could do with this. As you can see with mine, um, I've gone in and linked up with other um, people that I'm either following or that are following me or that are co-authors of mine and um, same thing with the other one where I can put in disciplines and various uh, types of topics that are there you can see here's some of the analytics that it keeps um, here you can affiliate with your institution so I've done that uh, on this particular one and it's it gives you notifications of when certain things happen you can see it provides weekly statistics so there's a lot of stuff that you can put in your profile here it's very similar to academia.edu but it is less commercial in nature um, it's worth noting that this was originally developed in Europe whereas academia.edu was originally developed in the US Another tool that you can use that is actually connected with our university system is Mendeley. And I say it's connected with our university system, and that's a recent thing since we've moved to the Open Athens system. So as you can see here, this is my profile. If I want to sign in, the first thing it will ask me is if I want to sign in with my institutional profile or do I want to sign in through something else. Now, up until we switched to Open Athens, it wouldn't give us this option. I actually used to connect it to my Google account. But now I can sign in through my institutional affiliation. So I'm going to uh, select my Toro One credentials. And let's just put those in there. And as you can see here now, it's going through and logging me in. So again, I have the ability to edit my profile and even see how it will look like. It does a really good job in terms of the statistics and providing a lot of information about the nature of uh, my work. Because it's connected to Elsevier, 
it does pull out a lot of the analytics that Elsevier has, but largely only the analytics that Elsevier has. So I can put in my ORC ID and my Scopus Author ID here as a part of that. Um, it'll actually go through and give me uh, media updates so I can see all the times that I've been quoted in the media or mentioned in the media. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that it'll have in here. One of the difficulties, I'd say, or one of the limitations of this is it only pulls in things that are in the Elsevier database. So anything beyond that, I would have to manually add. And as you can see here, it has only pulled in 35 of my publications, whereas as you can see with this one, I've manually added 205 to this one. Google Scholar has found Google Scholar has found 251 of my publications. So of the various ones that are out there, this is the one that would find the least amount automatically and the one that you would have to add the most manually. So that is one of the limitations of it. And because of that, a lot of the statistics that you get over here won't show up for the manual ones because, again, it's using the Elsevier database for these particular um, for this particular information. One that a lot of academics use to host their presentation material is SlideShare. So SlideShare is basically just a place where you can share PowerPoint slides or share slides in general. They don't have to be from PowerPoint. Um, I tend to post essentially all of the presentations that I do. This is where I post the slides and I always tell folks that if you go to my website and go to the uh, presentations link you'll be able to see a link to all of the slides and I've got almost 300 uh, slide decks that I've uploaded to this system so that people can actually see um, the the slides that I have and like many of the others I've got you know my institutional affiliation in here I've got my website little bio links to some of my other sites and like many of the other systems I can follow people people can follow me um, so it's a nice little model like that. If I were logged in, it would give me statistics about each of the presentations I've got, the number of times it's been viewed, if I've allowed it to be downloaded, the number of times it's been downloaded. Uh, so again, nice, useful way to put up slides that I'm using, not just for conference presentations, but you could use this as a way of sharing the slides with your students or with uh, groups that you're doing professional development with. Uh, so it's a nice little tool that can be used for those purposes. Another way in which we can highlight our scholarship is through blogging. So this is my, I call it my personal blog, but really it's the blog that I use around my research topic. So you can see here I've got an About Me page and uh, a little bit about some of the things that I'm involved in or try to do with this particular page. Uh, it allows you to subscribe to it in a number of ways, and I've got some of the links here. You can see all of the different tags that I talk about. I'll be honest and say that right now the vast majority of things that I post here are just things about my research area that come across my electronic desk. So it's sort of a one-stop shop for people that are interested in my research topic. Uh, that's how my blog has evolved, but if you go back and look to when I first started this back in March of 2005, what you were finding was I was basically writing specific entries about things related to my field. And it was kind of interesting because I still remember back then, and every time I would post an entry, I had a group of individuals, probably about 30 or 40 of them, and I would email them and basically say, I've posted a new entry, here's the link to it, please go and actually talk to to me there so make some comments there and as you can see some people did there's usually a few comments on on most of these so here's the very first entry I wrote back on March 12th and a bunch of people commented on that one and you can look through and and um, so depending upon what you want to use the blog for now I really use it as a service so that people can see the types of things that I'm seen so they don't have to subscribe to 20 newsletters and be involved with another dozen different organizations. I just do all of that and post it to my blog. Or you can do it sort of in this fashion where you're posting things that are 
um, of interest to you. In many cases, you'll see uh, I begin a lot of my articles by saying, you know, an article that came across my desk or a, a link that someone sent me or a, um, a presentation that I attended. See, in an article, in an article. Um, a while ago, I looked at this entry on this blog, and then I write a little bit of a commentary about those things. So, um, depending upon what you want to use your blog for, it allows you to get your ideas out there about various things happening in your field. Uh, so, that's another option that you have blogging and your blog can have very specific addresses so as you can see here I use WordPress as my interface and you can see I've got virtualschooling.wordpress.com which is actually a free service uh, that I'm using here uh, which is why the wordpress.com is there but I've been able to maintain that virtual schooling aspect in there. Uh, one of the things that we had showcased earlier this year um, by one of our colleagues here at Toro was the LinkedIn system. Uh, LinkedIn is a good place to create a professional profile. So as you can see here, this is my profile as I would see it. So you can see some of the information I've got in here. It allows me to add in more. Um, I can go in and edit some things out. I've got a very short about me section as you can see. It gives you some information about it although one of the things that you can do is pay for the premium service here and get a lot more analytics um, I've added in sort of my work experiences here uh, added in my education the skills and endorsements are things that other people do for you uh, you can ask people to give you recommendations you can also give other people recommendations one of the interesting things I find in here that I don't see used a lot is this accomplishments section. One of the things that it allows you to do is it allows you to add publications and patents and courses that you've completed or, or the courses that you teach. So you can see here Educational Leadership Literature Review is one of the courses I taught when I was at Sacred Heart University. Uh, there are a couple of publications that you can see that I've added in here and it allows me to add in the uh, abstract to it and some of the other information. And in all honesty, I'll say that most of these are ones that were posted by co-authors of mine. Uh, you can see here's the course that I taught. It was EDL 689. And um, so there's a lot of stuff that you can put into your LinkedIn profile that is faculty related that would allow you to highlight uh, you as a university scholar. So, and a lot of this stuff here often isn't um, showcased for folks when they are involved with uh, LinkedIn or when they are shown LinkedIn because it is so specific to being a university scholar. Uh, the courses you've taught or the articles you've published, uh, the projects that you lead or that you're involved with, uh, but it is things that you can use. Another tool that you can use is Twitter. Uh, Twitter is a good way to be able to get information out into the community. Uh, you'll see that one of the things that I primarily use it for is I've got it connected to my blog. So every time a blog entry is posted, a Twitter, uh, a tweet comes out so that people can see that. Um, I do retweet some other things along the way, and in some cases I'll engage in some conversations, but in all honesty, that tends to be fewer and far between. Uh, so here's a colleague of mine, actually a fraternity brother of mine, that is running for the liberal leadership and uh, in Ontario. Uh, so he's running to be the leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario, and um, so I retweeted something that he had posted. Uh, actually, I retweet him frequently because the campaign is going on right now, um, so I'm trying to help promote him. But you can see that there are um, various ways in which you can use this. Uh, you'll note that some cases here I have hashtags that you can see that are in here, and that will help people find um, your tweets a lot easier than... Um, 
if you were to just post them sort of like my blog does where there's no hashtag in here at all and um, it's a nice little tool that you can use both in terms of just getting the word out when I look every month at where the traffic comes from from my blog a lot of people actually will see these links here and will click on them to go to my blog so a lot of the traffic that I get comes from this particular source um, so it's a nice way again of putting out ideas. I've seen faculty members that will essentially tweet about articles that they see. Um, so they'll see something that comes out through the news or an academic article that is of interest to them and they'll put a little one sentence commentary about it and then a link to the original article that's there. So there's a, a number of little things that you can do like that that will allow you to use Twitter. Another social network that many of us are familiar with is Facebook. Now there's a couple of ways of using Facebook. I know many of us have joined Facebook and use it for personal reasons. Um, I'll be honest and say my profile tends to be a little of both, so um, much of what I will post or repost here tends to be either things I find funny or things related to uh, Veterans Affairs because of my involvement in the Royal Canadian Legion um, or just things that are cute like well, snow on the football field back in Athens at the University of Georgia where I would completed my PhD which I think is just hilarious uh, being from Canada um, but it allows you to again have that presence now many people and I'll show you an example here um, do have a personal Profile. So this is a colleague of mine, uh, Cliff Mims, and this is his personal page. Uh, so this is where he posts things for his friends. Uh, so the things here aren't professional in nature. They're things about his family and his life and what's going on. And accompanying that, he's actually created a page for himself. And his page is just cliffmims.com, just because Cliff Mims got or Cliff Mims com was available in terms of a thing. And this is where he posts all of his professional stuff. So you can see here he's talking about you know Google software stuff. Um, he's talking about his blogversary. So what you're seeing here, this one here, by the looks of it, because it's you can tell by just the way this here is appears to be something that he's pulling in from his blog so that's automatically coming in you can even see from the pictures that are here they're all about um, educational technology um, his posts recently are an article about nine successful things problem solving authentic learning uh, Google Sign Language, uh, G Suite. So you can see a lot of educational technology things that are being uh, talked about here. So this is what he uses for his professional Facebook space. So if you're using your profile as a personal thing where you connect with family and friends and post pictures of the kids and uh, talk about your trips and you know that kind of stuff and what your you know your food um, you can create a page that allows you to have a professional uh, side of things and essentially people would like your page or follow your page to get that content and even if they do follow your page you still don't have to let friend them on your profile and you can still keep your privacy settings in your Facebook profile quite tight so that way people can't find or can't access the personal things that you're putting up there but you can still put up these professional things uh, on your Facebook page so that's a, a nice little tool. Uh, the final one that I wanted to show is YouTube, and if you are a Google person, you YouTube is actually a Google service here now, so you can see I'm logged in, and it allows you to create a channel. So this is a good way of posting videos. Uh, so here's some of my popular ones, but you know I've got things that are linked to K-12 distance and online learning. So here's actual YouTube videos of some of my research presentations. Here's some of my uh, media items. Here's some playlists that I've got that are associated with my involvement with the Royal Canadian Legion here in the Bay Area. And as you look through the information that you've got here, 
um, you can see here's all of the videos that I've posted and as you can see there's a lot of things for silt with how to do stuff with canvas because that's where I host a lot of those videos um, you can organize it through playlists so as you can see here I've got a whole whack of playlists that are available some that I highlight uh, but you can see all of the playlists that I've got here so some are associated specifically with courses um, some are around events or things that uh, projects I've been involved in and um, you can see that it does allow you to have discussions nobody discusses things with me unfortunately uh, you can have an about and you can see I don't have anything in my about so my channel is actually quite small in terms of um, the amount of stuff I'm putting here and as you can see I've only got 76 subscribers uh, but those people are notified whenever I post things so um, you can see I've got a channel that I want to highlight here that I've been involved in, but it's not my official channel. Here's a, a video that I specifically want to highlight so that people can see. Um, it's, I guess, one of the ones I want to showcase, if you will. Uh, it was an interview I did with a, a colleague of mine in Texas. And, um, you know, so that's this particular option. So, again, there's a lot of different tools that are out there these are just some of them and over the next four or five months we are going to go through and spend 15 to 20 minutes uh, each month looking at uh, two or three tools and how you can use them and set them up so as you see these tools being advertised if one of the ones that I've quickly demoed for you here is of interest to you then that's something that you might want to a session you might want to show up for